All right, welcome to Gethsemane Church. Good to see each and every one of you out this morning. Uh, I want to recognize, I just, I want all the Bible school workers to stand up. If you, if you worked in Bible school, stand up. If you worked in Bible school, it's real easy. If you worked in Bible school, stand up. <laughs> if you worked in Bible school, stand up. If you already got an award, that's okay, stand up anyway. If you worked in Bible school, stand up. All right, let's give all of these people a hand. They, did, they all did a fabulous job. Can't say enough about all of them. I mean, Sister Tab put in countless hours, and uh, Rachel and Chris, they're, they're not here this morning. They put in countless hours. These girls put in countless hours. Go bus drivers. I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the heroes. Uh, the bus drivers are the heroes of Bible school. I don't care what anybody says. They are the heroes of, of, of Bible school. So we give them, uh, we give them uh, all, the, all the congratulatory uh, round of applause we can give them. And, and I hope whatever they gave Hannah, I hope she had an extra little uh, amount in hers because she not only missed her Bible camp, she actually had to take a pie in the face. And, and, <laughs> and there was never any chance that she wasn't going to get a pie in the face. I mean, the, the girls always win the offering. and They, they just always win. So uh, we, we appreciate her sacrifice of knowing she she was going to get a pie in the face from the very beginning of Bible school without a chance of getting out of that. <laughs> Unless she had some summer job we didn't know about and could uh, contribute a lot of money. But uh, it was a great Bible school, and uh, it, we're glad that all of you are here for uh, the, the annual Snow Cone Sunday. So if you would, um, take your Bibles this morning for our message. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're just going to focus on one verse and one verse only. Um, it won't be a lengthy sermon, I don't believe. I never know, but um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 for our text. And while you're turning there, you know it's Snow Cone Sunday. This has been kind of a tradition for our church in the last several years, you know. The first Sunday after Bible school, we have Snow Cone Sunday. And what a nice, refreshing thing that is on a hot day. So uh, our text, hopefully, um, hopefully by the time this message is over, um, you can quote this verse. Um, maybe by the time I read it once, you can quote it. It's only 11 words, so it's not a lengthy verse. But it's one that maybe you can carry with you this week for sure. And maybe you can carry it with you the rest of your life. Um, you know, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Um, most of us, if we would be honest, we're slacking in our, in our Bible memory. Uh, I know I am. Um, I have not been doing a very good job of, uh, I've been so busy, I haven't, I haven't been able to focus on that. But we can learn one verse this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. And thank you for the time that we have here in service this morning. So very thankful to be able to begin our week in the house of worship. May we hear as the word of God is read. Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd move in this service. You know, without the Holy Spirit, the service would be in vain, and we don't want that. So God, take over this service and use it for thy glory. No doubt there are people that will hear this message that need to be saved. We pray, Lord, that you'll speak to them, show them their condition, and show them that you have a way of salvation. Show them your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message this morning is A Holy Heart. A Holy Heart. You know, the heart is an amazing muscular organ. Uh, it's the, about the size of an adult fist. So your heart is about this size this morning. It beats on average 75 times a minute. Uh, pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood a day. You know, your, your, your heart could actually fill the average swimming pool in 15 days. You think about that. I mean, that's a gross, gross thing to think about, but that's how much your heart pumps. It pumps and pumps and pumps and faithfully pumps throughout your whole life. If, if your heart were to stop pumping, you would not be living. Uh, the average heartbeat will be 2.5 billion times in your life. If you live to be 70 years old, which is the average age, your heart would beat 2.5 billion times. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 8, our memory verse this morning, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But we know Jesus wasn't talking about the muscular organ in our chest that just pumps blood throughout our body. Jesus was not speaking about a muscular organ that is totally physical, and really all it does is just pump blood through your body and gives your body life. Jesus was talking about something much more deep than just the physical heart that pumps blood in your body. When you talk about the heart, you're referring to the inner part of anything, the middle part or interior, as the heart of a country, kingdom, or empire, 
the heart of a town or the heart of a tree. If you take the heart of a tree, what are you talking about? You're talking about the very center of that tree. You know, when we cut wood up uh, to use it for different things, if you cut the center, you'll see the very heart of that tree is the very center part of that tree. You know, in, in, in the Bible, we're all familiar with the Bible, uh, God gave his tabernacle in the wilderness. And we, you know, pastor has a wonderful picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness in his office. And, you know, it has all the tents around it and it has the, the nice curtains around it. And then inside the curtains is, is the, the tabernacle. And inside that, there's a place called the Holy of Holies. And if you were to say, what is the heart of the temple of God? It would be the Holy of Holies. Well, what is, what is the, the heart uh, of your life? It is, your, it is the very essence of who you are. When God, says, um, when God says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, he's talking about blessed are those who are pure on the inside. He's referring to your spiritual heart, the very essence of who you are. Biblically, the heart is the seat of of the affections and passions, as love, joy, grief, enmity, courage, cowardice, pleasure, lust, envy, all of these things come from the heart. All of these, the Bible said, come from within. You know, Jesus was very angry with the Pharisees because the Pharisees looked really good on the outside. They were really polished on the outside, but inside they were corrupt. Inside they were filthy. Inside they were vile. And Jesus said, you know what? If you really want to clean someone, because our society has a problem today. If you haven't looked around, we have a problem with violence. We have a problem with anger. We have a problem with cursing. We have a problem with all kinds of filth that's coming out. Where does that come from? Jesus said, you don't just go and clean the outside of a person. Jesus said, let me on the inside, and if I'm on the inside of your life, I can do the most good because from the inside is where everything comes out. Out of the mouth, out of the mouth, we think, well, those words come out. Where do they come from? They come from the heart. It is the heart that originates those thoughts, whether they're uh, grief or joy or love or enmity, whether they're pleasure or lust or envy. The heart is the center of who you are. It is the controlling force of your life. And that is what Jesus is control. He's so concerned with the driving force of your life that he spends time asking people, where's your heart? Where is your heart this morning? Is your heart on God? The Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, my goal in life is to see God. Amen. I hope that's your goal in life. I mean, you're in church this morning. I would assume that, you know, at some point when you got ready for church this morning, part of the reason you're coming, I hope, is to know God, to know God better. And someday he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a great promise that is. Amen. The heart is the center of who you are. It is the controlling force of your life. Just as the physical heart is the center of life for the body, because the Bible says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. God designed the human body. He gave the physical heart blood to pump through, which he calls life. The human body doesn't have another option. Uh, it, it needs blood, and when it pumps blood, the body lives. Can you imagine if you tried to substitute uh, the blood in the body for mud? You, can you imagine the problem that was, you know, because they do, they do these uh, blood transfusions and they'll, they'll hook you up and they'll, what do they do? They pump good, fresh blood in there to revive the body. Can you imagine if you took one of those machines and hooked it up to mud and started plumping in and all of a sudden your heart would stop beating like that? Think about that. To pump filth into a healthy body and just think that it's going to be able to continue to function the way it's functioning. Well, today we're talking spiritually. I think you can understand where I'm going with this spiritually. Pumping mud into your spiritual heart trying to get life out of that. Can you imagine substituting mud for blood? What would happen? Your body would die. Isn't that what people are doing with their spiritual heart? In the, in the, in the society we live in, isn't that what they're trying to do right now with their, with, with, with their spiritual heart? Trying to pump mud in? I mean, think about your eyes, what you take in with your eyes every day. Think about what you take in with your ears every day. Think about what some people are taking in their mouth and digesting every day. That's the physical body that you're taking into, but some of these things hurt you spiritually, trying to pump mud into their body. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 9, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? No one. There's nobody on earth who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Because the Bible says, O generation, Jesus said this, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure's heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Young people, I want you to pay attention this morning. Young people, I want you to listen up this morning. I want to see a little eye contact with you young people. 
Middle-aged people, I, I want you to pay attention this morning. I want a little eye contact with you middle-aged people. Older people, sorry. The truth hurts. As a pastor, as a preacher, as someone who is going to read the Word of God, I have to be honest with you. Some of you are old. You need to pay attention too. The Bible applies to whether you're young, whether you're middle-aged, or whether you're old. The Bible speaks directly to you. And when Jesus gave these words, he was not speaking just to a select group of people. He was speaking to mankind. Amen? What comes out of your mouth originated in your heart. You got a problem with cursing, you got a heart problem. Amen? You got a problem with a foul mouth, you got a heart problem. If your heart's pumping out mud, you won't see God. Amen? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Are you having dirty thoughts? The creator of those dirty thoughts is your dirty heart. Is your heart pumping out mud? You won't see God. Amen? A man I recently, a man I know, recently had a heart attack. It's a scary thing. He's younger than I am. This should scare me a little bit. <laughs> he's younger than I am. He had a heart attack. Praise the Lord. We prayed for him, and, and he's doing well, and he's, I, we're going to continue to pray for him. He's going to continue to do well. But you know what? I've seen this man eat before, and the things he stuffed in his face before the heart attack, and I've seen after he went to the doctor and had the consultation, and after he had the heart attack, and after the doctor said, your diet is going to drastically change from this point forward, and I've seen how his diet has drastically changed from this point forward. Now, it's only been a month. We'll see if it continues. But I want to tell you something. His diet before and his diet after is totally different because he understands he might want to take care of his heart, and what he puts into his face affects his heart. I want to tell you something spiritually. What you put into your face and what you put into your ears and your eyes and your mouth affects your spiritual heart. And your spiritual heart is even more important than your physical heart. You can't live without your physical heart. You can't go through eternity without a spiritual heart that's been converted by God. But even Christians, I mean, I see Christians who do things that they shouldn't do. Why? Because they've got some problems in their heart. Their heart isn't pure. Pure means what? Pure. Without, without, without something that is contaminating it. God wants you to have a pure heart. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He's not asking you to do something that's impossible. I'm not talking about sinless perfection here. None of us will be perfect till we reach heaven. But what is the goal? I talked to you the other day. I was talking to somebody back in, behind, downstairs after Bible school. And I said, listen, the goal has to be perfection. The Bible says, be perfect as God has asked you to be perfect. Why? Because those of us who shoot like to shoot, you know, you get your stance right. You, you make sure you're doing everything right. And what do you aim at? You aim at the very bullseye of the target for a reason. Because if you aim small, you will miss small. If you aim wide, you'll, you'll miss wide. You can miss the whole target. God says, listen, I want you to aim as small as Jesus Christ is as far as perfection goes, which means he's perfect, he's the bullseye, he is your goal. You won't reach it, but if you just pull your, pull your pistol out and go like that and shoot and say, well, I tried. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. If you tried, you would be in the proper position, you would have your face toward the target, you'd have your eyes lined up with the target, and you would be aiming at the bullseye. Yet Christians do that. They look like a bunch of Western shooters. I mean, I shoot the, see these guys, I like watching old westerns, you know that, I talk about this all the time. I mean, you watch these old westerns, and before Hollywood was really good, they would go like this, and the guy over there would be dead. And you'd be like, his gun wasn't even pointing in the right direction. But that's how Christians are today. They go, I'm following Jesus. No, you're not. You're not following Jesus, and everyone knows you're not following Jesus. You cannot be looking at pornography and following Jesus. You cannot be spewing filth out of your mouth and be following Jesus. The Bible would say you're a liar and you better check your heart to see if you've ever had a conversion of heart. Some people need a heart transplant. Some, some people need a heart surgery. Christians sometimes need a heart surgery. The lost, you need a heart transplant. Amen? There are people pretending like they're trying. Some are lost. Some are saved, but they need God to do a work in their heart. A heart attack would give you a, a big wake-up call. I mean, it really would. I mean, you think about it right now. You haven't had a, most of you, I don't think, have had a heart attack. Some of you, maybe. 
It would have to wake you up. I don't know, a lot of you have probably had a close call with death. I mean, if you've driven a car very long, you probably have. If you've driven a motorcycle, you, you, whether you knew it or not, you did have a close call with death. I mean, I drove a motorcycle for a while, and I, I guarantee you I had several close calls with death. And praise God that God was long-suffering enough not to take me at those times in my life when I was totally not ready and my heart was definitely not pure. And it was only the long-suffering of God that said, I've given you more time so that you can hear the gospel, so you can see a Christian who actually has a pure heart and is walking before me, wanting to follow me with their whole heart. I want that for you. There'll be some Christians who don't have, you know, there'll be some Christians, I, you know, I'm not talking about sinless perfection this morning. That's not what I'm talking about. We don't believe that you have to be sinlessly perfect to go to heaven. We believe that your sins need to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, the only way that you can be clean. You can't work your way to heaven, but God's paid the price and you need to take the offering that he's given you and accept that. And when you do that, the gratitude in your heart is, I'm going to follow this person. You can't admit someone died for you and then just disregard everything about that person. What I'm trying to say is he had a heart attack. It was a huge wake-up call for him. He has repented about the junk he was stuffing into his face. America needs to repent of the stuff that they are stuffing into their face, into their ears, into their eyes, into their face, their heart. You know, I mean, racism and violence. Riots and looting. Drugs and alcohol. Pornography and prostitution. Where do these things come from? We can blame the culture all we want. We can blame all kinds of things. Jesus said it comes from the heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jesus said, I, I've come to give you life and that you might have life more abundantly. I've come to give you a heart transplant if you'll only receive it. So many people just ignore God. They do their own thing. But America has a heart that's pumping out mud instead of blood. And it can't go on living like that. I mean, you take mud in your eyes, you take mud in your mouth, you take mud in your ears. Your spiritual heart has nothing to pump but mud. And the heart controls the body. You think about, you think about, you think about the, the essence of who you are, you know, where all these thoughts originate. And you, know, you, you bring these things into your mind that are not good, and you're, you're, you start to let that grow into your heart. And, and then all of a sudden, you're not just thinking about it, you're doing the action you know, because the Bible says, you know, lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. It's not talking about the physical death of a man. It's talking about the spiritual death of the heart. But how much, you, how much you're controlled by your thoughts and your desires that come from your heart. You know, man's experimenting right now with technology that allows him to think and something happens. They've been experimenting in this. I mean, you could go back 20 years, and they were trying to experiment with how you could maybe control a plane with your thoughts. And I know Facebook right now and some of these Instagram and some of these other, other tech companies are trying to, trying to, they're actually spending money trying to figure out how they can help develop things that are controlled by thought. And you think, well, wouldn't it be amazing if you could put on this headgear and, and you could control a drone or an airplane and have it fly around, you could just control it by thinking? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? You have a body that you control by thinking. God designed a body that can be controlled by thinking. And it's a wonderful thing, but it's also a very scary thing. Because out of the heart come forth murder, lies, cheating. But God says, I can take that heart and I can bring the truth out of it. I can bring love out of it. I can bring joy out of it. I can bring peace out of it. But it has to be God on the inside. I mean, you look at the unsaved world today. I wouldn't call them blessed. I mean, if I turn on the news and just look at what the news stories out there, I wouldn't be, well, those people look really blessed. <laughs> you know, as, as I looked at, the, at, the, at, at, at that city, that, 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 that the people who took over who wanted to just kind of have their own tropical utopia, I wouldn't have looked at that city with the, the, the graffiti all over the place and just slums everywhere, and I would have thought, those, are, those people look blessed. No, because out of the heart proceeds evil things. And when you take God out of the equation, which is what they were doing, they are basically going down to humanism. And humanism always leads to depravity. I wouldn't call them blessed. I've never seen anything like what we're going through right now. But when you as a person, when you as a person, or a family, or a school, or a political party, 
or a city or a state or even a country decide to kick God out, the open invitation is to the devil. I mean, we've seen this with school especially. You know, they, take, they kick prayer and the Ten Commandments out of school, and it wasn't too much longer than that that you had the first school shooting, and then more school shootings and more and more and more because what happens when you take God out of school? You would just say, open invitation to the devil. Come on in. Families have done that. They've said, you know what? We don't need to go to church. We don't need to learn about God. We don't need to teach our children about God. And what's happening? Divorce is rampant. All kinds of problems in the home because people have said, you know what? I don't think I need this. I don't feel like I need this. And that comes, that feeling comes from their heart because the devil has planted a seed in there that says, what you want is more important than what God wants. Amen. All right, amen. Out of the mouth of babes sometimes. You know, most people don't have God in their heart, and so the devil is there. Broken homes, hurting children. And if you want to see where a society is heading... All you have to do is just, and I don't recommend you do this, but turn on the television and see the programming. TV programming is programming you to be what they want you to be in a few years, and it's always a few years ahead of its time. If you go back in history and when TV first came out, they were always pushing the envelope, trying to get society and dragging them along to the narrative to where they want them to be. And if you look at the television programs today, you're like, wow, this is wicked. I mean, Satanism is everywhere. Satanic witchcraft is all over the TV. And you think, well, it's not that bad right now. Well, it's going to be. That's where we're going. That's where they're pushing people to go, and people are just sucked right in. So if you like TV programming right now, you're going to love the future. And I say that very facetiously because wicked hearts do like darkness. But Revelation does not really seem like a wonderful place to live on this earth. John 3, 19 says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. You don't have to try to have a wicked heart. We're born with one. I mean, you just don't have to try. It's, it's like a child. You don't have to teach a child to lie. They just know how to lie. We don't, you know, and it's the same way with food. You know what, I mean, I watched this guy that had a heart attack, and man, he was in there trying to get an ice cream out of the freezer the other day, and everybody's like, you can't eat that. You can't have that. They told you you can't have that, but he wanted an ice cream. Why do you want ice cream? Because an ice cream's easy, and it tastes great. But he, the doctor told him he can't have it. But isn't it, you don't have to, I mean, nobody has to tell us, tell us to eat bad. I mean, you offer, you offer me a candy bar, I'm going to eat it. Because, you know, it just tastes good. It feels good, but it's not good. It takes discipline to eat healthy. If you want a pure, I mean, do, the question of this morning, do you want a pure heart? And that's what I'm asking. That's what, if I break everything down this morning, what I'm asking you is, do you want a pure heart? Do you want to have a holy heart? I mean, if, if, I, walk into your, if, if I walk into somebody's house, and there's just dirt cluttered everywhere, and I could go on the floor and just sweep up piles of dirt, I'm going to assume they don't want a clean house when I see the vacuum that has more dirt on it than, than anything else in the house because it's been sitting there with cobwebs on it for years. They could have a clean house. They don't want a clean house. If they don't want a clean house, they're never going to have a clean house. Some people, I could walk in their house, I couldn't find, I could, I could eat off their carpet, I could eat off their, their floor, I could eat off anywhere because there's no dirt, there's no dust, there's nothing in there. And how much they care for that house. Some people are like that in person. You know, everybody that I know here has running water. You can be clean. You don't have to stink. But some people don't have good hygiene. They don't think about it. They haven't been taught that way. And they never look in the mirror. Sometimes we need to look in the mirror and say, I'm dirty. I stink. Do I want to smell good? Do I want to look good so I can present myself for others? Well, with our heart, that's what God's asking. Do you want to have a holy heart? Do you want to have a pure heart? And, and, and we, we think as Christians, because we've been so hypnotized by the world that you can come and say this little prayer and you can get up and leave the exact same way you are. Nothing changes in your life and somehow your heart's been made pure and you'll go to heaven, but everything else can be the exact same. You can still watch the same thing. You can still do the same thing. You can still talk the same way. And that's a false gospel. 
The blood that saves you is the blood that changes you and gives you a new heart and new desires and a new want to do God's will. It's not, it's not a works-based salvation. It is a love-based salvation saying, God died for me. He shed his blood. He's changed my heart from a heart of stone and he gave me a heart of flesh. And now I want to serve him with everything I have. And if you haven't had that, you haven't been born again. It's that simple. There are so many people who sit on church pews all over this country who have never been born again. They've never had the heart transplant that God wants to give them. And they think, hypocritically, you know, hypocr hypocr hypocritically they think they're, they're going to heaven and they're going to see God. It won't happen. I mean, if you have a dirty house, you have to look around and say, do I want a clean house? If you have a dirty heart, you need to think really hard. Have I been saved? And have I just backslidden and I need God to do some surgery in my heart? Or have I never been saved and I need a heart transplant? Young person, the Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? You know, the first place to jump into is read God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God can take your heart and he can change your desires. This morning, the message is a holy heart. Do you want one? Are you content with a wicked heart that pumps mud, not blood? Because so many people are. And if you are, you should just admit it. Just admit it. You, you, you have more chance of going to heaven by admitting it and saying, you know what? I have our dirty heart. I want to be dirty and I want to stay dirty and I want to be filthy. And at least if maybe someday if you get so filthy, you'll hit the ground so hard that you'll look up and see God. The Bible says a hypocrite's hope shall perish. That's the most dangerous place in the world to be is a hypocrite. Pretending to be something that you're not. If you don't desire a pure heart, a holy heart, I'm going to tell you something this morning. You'll never have a pure heart. You'll never have a holy heart. In Matthew 5, 8, the words that Jesus spoke during the Sermon on the Mount were recorded. It's just 11 words on this sentence. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is what we call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are something to be. Amen? It's something we should attain to be. Beatitude inherited is blessedness from the Latin and means both happy and blessed. In the Bible, the Beatitudes is a series of eight blessings. This is just one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What an amazing promise. I mean, think about that. Don't you want to be pure in heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your goal is happiness, it ought to be holiness. If your goal is happiness, it ought to be holiness, because the only way to be truly happy is to be truly holy. And you can't do it on your own. But listen, when God gives you the transplant of a new heart, he also plants in there the Holy Spirit. So that you can have a holy heart that wholly follows him. And that's really the secret of joy and happiness and contentment. The Holy Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart. It doesn't say, blessed are the pure in head. It says, blessed are the pure in heart. John Gill wrote this. He said, not in the head for men have, not in the head for men may have pure notions and impure thoughts. Not in the hand or action or in outward conversation only. So the Pharisees were outwardly righteous before men, but inwardly full of impurity. But God says, in the heart. You know, I want a holy heart. And I think if we could just get this, this, this just little 11 word verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when temptation comes, maybe you, you have your phone out and you're going to look at something you shouldn't look at. You can think of this verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do I really want to look at that? And pump mud into my system instead of the blood of Jesus Christ. When, I, when I'm tempted to hear something I should not hear, maybe I should just quote this verse. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do I really want to risk not seeing God and not knowing God and having an impure heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Maybe I should quote that verse because Jesus gave the Beatitudes right after he'd went through the temptations in the wilderness. And when he was in the temptations in the wilderness, what did he do to defeat the devil? He quoted scripture to the devil. The word of God, the physical word of God, quoting the written word of God to the devil, who also can quote scripture, by the way, misquote scripture, but he can sure quote it. 
There are healthy looking people who eat like gluttons and they're one heartbeat away from a heart attack. And so there are people in church who eat like gluttons all through the week, spiritually I'm talking about, and they're one heartbeat away from a heart attack, spiritually, lost. Oh, they look good on the outside, but if you can see their arteries, they're 99.9% .9 blocked. That's a dangerous place to be, to look good. So good that no doctor would look at you and say, there's a problem. To look so good that no, no other Christian or pastor would look at you and say, there's a problem. That's a dangerous place to be. At least if you look like you're about to have a heart attack, the doctors, everybody's, all your friends are like, you need to go to the hospital. I mean, the guy that had a, had a heart attack at our work, he, he goes, I've got shooting pains in my left arm. He goes, it feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. And he told us this the day before. And everybody's like, you need to go to the hospital. You're overweight. Your arm has shooting pain. You have something feeling like a a, a, an elephant on your chest. You need to go to the hospital. And he did. And because he was at the hospital, praise God, he was okay. Because the doctors understood, we need to help this guy. Yeah, if, at least if you're lost, so lost that you're, you, you, you've got the pain shooting through your left arm and you've got the elephant sitting on your chest, at least people look at you and go, wow, he needs Christ. It's the danger, the dangerous place to be is the hypocrites who are 99.9% .9 blockage in their artery and nobody sees any problem. And that's what we have as a whole in America in churches is the majority of church people are going to hell. But they look good. Oh, what, what a constellation that's going to be. Stand before God. Well, he looks good physically, but man, look at that soul. Rotten, 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 rotten. Look at what he looked at all through the week. Look at what he was doing all through the week. And then he'd go to church and pray. What a joke. Those who die with a wicked heart will not see God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Not everyone is going to heaven. In fact, the Bible says it's few. Few that be there find it. When I think of pure, I think of pure like white snow. You know, that's what the Bible talks about when it talks about purity. You know, white as the driven snow. And we're about to have snow cones. And, man, I like snow cones. I don't know if it's heart healthy. Is snow cones heart healthy? I don't know. Here we're talking about the heart, and we're going to have snow cones afterwards. You know, it's a physical heart. You know, we are going to die. We've got to be ready to die. But we, we shouldn't abuse our bodies. We should take care of them. But, you know, s snow, why does, why does snow? And, and Brother Brent and Sister Tyler are going to go out there and they're going to make snow cones for us. So after search, you're going to have to give them a little bit of time because it takes a little bit of time to make the snow cones. But, you know, they're going to run that ice through that machine. It's going to kick it out like snow. It's going to be white as snow. How beautiful that is. And, I, and they're going to dip. They're going to take one of those funnels. They're going to dip a bunch of white, look, white looking snow right on top of there. And then an ugly old fly is going to come land right in the middle of one of your snow cones. Yeah. An ugly old fly is going to... And you're going to look at that snow cone. Well, it's 99% good. Why don't you just go ahead and take it out and eat it? You're going to be like, no, the whole thing's ruined. I'm going to throw the whole thing away. Yet our soul, we, we oh, I can look at that. I can look at that. It'll be okay. I can take that into my ear. It'll be okay. I can take that, into my, I can take that, that alcohol into my mouth. It'll be okay. And we want God to, we want God to, to partake of that. When we wouldn't let us one fly land in our snow cone and still eat it? Yeah, these kids, they understand. One fly can ruin a whole snow cone. One bad thought can ruin a pure heart. Amen? You'd throw that snow cone away and nobody would blame you. In fact, we'd say, get rid of it. We, we, got, plenty of, we got plenty of snow. We got plenty more ice. We'll dish you up another one. You make sure no fly lands in it. You can put whatever kind of syrup you want on it. It's going to be good. But we have dead flies in our heart and we ask God to overlook it. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 8, I hope, you're, I hope you have this memorized. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to be happy? Have a holy heart. You want to be content? You want to be content? In a world where no one's content? I've got to have something bigger. I have to have something better. I have to have this. I have to have that. You want to be content? Have a holy heart. You want to have a good family? Do you want to have a good family? You know, I don't know too many people, even wicked people a lot of times, you know, they, they would probably not say they don't want to have a good family. Have a holy heart. It starts with you. 
It doesn't start with your son or your daughter. It doesn't start with your wife or your mother. It doesn't start with someone else. It starts with you. I mean, you want to have a good city or a good government or a good, good, good country? Have a holy heart. It's, it has to start with you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We may say this morning, I don't have a holy heart. I have bad thoughts. I say bad things. Well, the Bible says that, that that's the treasure of your heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, your, your heart must be treasuring bad thoughts. Your heart must be treasuring bad things. The Bible says, young person, listen to me, young person. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything that flows forth from your life comes from your heart. God wants you to have a pure heart. And you cannot have a pure heart by pumping mud in there. And you can't do it on your own. But you better be trying as hard as you can while God gives you the extra strength that you need to get it done. That's a problem with a lot of Christians today. They just supernaturally think God is going to pick up some lazy person and just make him everything he should be without any effort from that person. God wants you involved. You look at, you look at a lot of the miracles God did. He had man involved. He said, you go fill the water pots. I'll do the impossible. You go get the water pots. You bring them here. You fill them full of water. I'll do the impossible. God will do the impossible, but you have to do your part. You have to come to him. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Keep the heart with all diligence for out of the issues of life. You say, I don't have a holy heart. Well, you can have a holy heart this morning. Amen. That's the good news. You know, that's what I'm getting to in this whole thing. And I'm about ready to close. We've got two minutes left. I can, I can have your, you know, I, I, two more minutes. I can, I, I can have you out of here. We, we can have a pure heart. If, if, if you're a Christian and you're struggling with impure thoughts, words, actions, let God do the surgery that needs to be done in your heart. You know, he's the great surgeon. He designed the heart. So he, when he goes in there and he, he looks in your heart, he says, oh, this shouldn't be there. Oh, you know, nope, uh, no, no, this shouldn't be there. You know it shouldn't be there. Your conscience tells you it shouldn't be there. The Holy Spirit says it shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be there. Let me do the surgery. I'll be happy to do the surgery, but I have to have you humble yourself enough to say this is the problem, and then I'll come in and do the surgery for you. I'll do the impossible. you got to do the possible. Amen? God says, I'll do the impossible. You have, to do the impo you have to do the possible. The possible is admitting that you have a problem, and when you admit you have a problem, God will come do the impossible. Amen? What I'm saying is true, and you know it's true. So if you're a Christian and you're having problems, you need to let the great physician, the great surgeon, come in and do heart surgery. If you're lost this morning, you need a total heart transplant. Sometimes the doctor will go in there and he'll look at that heart and say, no, nope, this heart's got to go. No, this, heart's not, this heart isn't going to work. Uh, this heart's been pumping mud so long, it is no longer any good. It's hard as stone. It, it, is no, it has no more function left in it. It cannot do anything. You need a heart transplant, but, but praise God, God can do a heart transplant. Amen? The Bible, talk, the Bible talks about a heart of flesh, which is a heart that has been saved by God, and a heart of stone, which is a heart that needs to be transplanted. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. You know, the invitation is this morning, do, do, you, want, do you want a holy heart? If you're a Christian, do you want a holy heart? If you do, come and say, you know what? I know what the problem is, God. I, I'm admit, willing to admit it. I'm willing to forsake it. I'm willing to do everything I can. But maybe I have an addiction and I need your help. You need to do the impossible because all I can do is the possible. And my possible is just coming and admitting that I'm a sinner. And, and even though I've been saved, I need you to do some heart surgery. And if you're lost this morning, you need to come to God and say, I do want a pure heart. I do want a holy heart. I want a different family. I want a different result in my life because doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is the absolute definition of insanity. Many people go, well, I'm gonna clean myself up. And they go out without God and they do the possible, but they can't do the impossible. They can never change their heart. God has to change your heart. God has to do the impossible. He said, you must be born again. You have to have a new heart. So if you're lost this morning, God is the only one who can give you the heart transplant you need, but you have to first humble yourself enough to say, I've got a problem. I might look good on the outside, but I've got a ticker problem. Maybe I don't look good on the outside, but I've got a ticker problem. And if you'll humble yourself like that, 
God gives grace to the humble. He's never rejected a sincere sinner who came to him for salvation. That's the good news. Amen? On Snow Cone Sunday, he can take your heart that's got an ugly old fly in it, and he can give you a new one. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the service this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to do heart surgery, and we're thankful that you're able to do a heart transplant. Some here this morning need a heart surgery. Lord, they're, they're, they're saved. They're going to heaven. But, Father, they've got, they've got ugly flies in their life and in their heart. And, Lord, they need you to come and take those things out and show them how to walk forward and not fall back into those same temptations. Uh, there's some here today, maybe, out, out online for sure, who are lost. They need a heart transplant, Father. And, Father, we just praise you that you've done it to us, so we know you can do it for others. And we just pray, Lord, that there's anyone here that's lost, that they would come for that heart transplant that only you can do for them. And we just pray, Lord, that they'll be humble enough to admit it and come and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ask for a song of invitation this morning.